wow guys this build is insane the mapping is great the bossing is incredible and it has a lot of defensive layers so it's not squishy either um, overall i think in all my time playing poe this has probably been one of the best builds i've ever had the opportunity to play and i'm really actually surprised that Bladefall and Blade Blast are not more meta than they are, considering that there's a number of mechanics within those skills that you can abuse pretty heavily to get really great numbers without really insane investment. So what I'm going to do is basically kind of go over the build, um, what the play style is like, uh, some of the itemization, and the skill tree. So first, um, it is a two-button build, essentially. You have a Bladefall, and then you'll see it leaves some lingering blades and then you trigger those with blade blast and you'll see that the aoe's have a really nice overlap so this overlap is the mechanic that we are abusing to do all the damage you saw in the introductory montage so that being said it's a physical spell we aren't converting any of the damage we're doing all physical damage on top of that um it is a power charge build on the assassins, so we are stacking as many power charges as we possibly can and using uh, those power charges to scale out the rest of the build. So that being said, first I'll kind of go over the gems and you know how everything kind of works and comes together. Um, so here you see we have Bladefall supported by either Awaken Spell Cascade if you can afford that or regular Spell Cascade. They both work great. Awaken Spell Cascade just gives you more coverage when mapping and depending on the size of the boss you're fighting can give you a little extra single target damage as well. We have Unleash support. This allows us to bring multiple volleys down and leave more lingering blades. We have concentrated effect because the closer and smaller the AoE of Bladefall, the more overlap we're going to get from the blades when we detonate them. And then, of course, we have Bladefall itself. And something important to recognize here is that Bladefall can have a maximum of 40 lingering blades. Now, obviously, as you can see, we put down way more than 40 blades coming down in that volley. And you also notice that the only blades left on the ground are sort of in front. It's not really leaving any blades in the back of the volley. So the way we deal with this to maximize our damage is as soon as we cast Blade Fall, we immediately cast Blade Blast, and then we cast it again. And what this does is it Blade Fall kind of comes down in a gradient cascade. So when we press Blade Blast twice like that, we're detonating the first set of blades that initially hit the ground, and then we're detonating the second set of blades that hit the ground at the end. So in this way, we're detonating way more than the 40 blade cap that you would normally see in Blade Fall if we just waited for Blade Fall to finish and for all the blades to wind up on the ground. As for Blade Blast, this is in our six link. Uh, we have Blade Blast, Awakened Brutality Support, Intensified, Power Charge on Critical Support, Awakened Controlled Destruction Support, and Awakened Increased Area of Effect Support. Uh, we don't have a lot of support options um, since this is a physical spell, so we can't use Elemental Focus. Um, we can't use Physical to Lightning or Added Fire Damage. So we have a limited number of supports that we can choose from. And in my playing and testing, um, I think the two best things you can use are things that really increase your AoE. So originally I was running just increased area of effect and I was running energy shield leech instead of intensify but from what I can tell more AoE is actually more damage even if we put in energy leech support here and even if we're leeching so we're getting the maximum amount of damage we could do which you can see here would be 39% more damage our blade blasts don't have as much area of effect and so they don't overlap as much and so you actually end up doing less damage even though it's a more damage multiplier um, so really i think stacking increased area of effect with intensify support is actually going to give you the most damage because you're going to be overlapping those blades and so if one blade say um, in this build gives you 500,000 you know damage per second and now you multiply that out because all your blades are overlapping you're doing millions upon millions more damage than if you just had a sort of flat more multiplier um, but the blades weren't really overlapping so that's really going to be the best um, gem setup for that as far as your auras we have war banner cast when damage taken support um, steel skin we have val grace for a little bit of extra dodge 
We have flesh and stone, blood and sand, pride, and we have an enlightened support just to give us a little bit more comfort in our mana. If you don't have an enlightened support, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. The build still plays fine. The spells aren't too expensive. And because one cast puts so many blades down, you really don't have to spam it too much. Um, so the mana really isn't an issue on this build. And then in terms of what we use socket in our wands, I like to use dash. Um, you could use flame dash and we're supporting with arcane surge to get that more spell damage and a bit more increased cast speed. And then for bosses, honestly, you really don't even need this. Sometimes I don't even bother to cast it, um, but we do have orb of storms with curse on hit and vulnerability. So in terms of the gear, um, I mentioned this is a power charge build. So we do have two void batteries. Um, then we have this helmet. Uh, the most important mod here is the plus one to maximum power charges. You can get this by harvest crafting on a warlord helmet. Um, and then if you have the currency, you can awaken or orbit together with an elder helm for nearby enemies take 9% increased physical damage. For an amulet, um, really the important mod here I think is the physical damage leashes life. Uh, really helps with the sustain. It's an elder mod. They're pretty cheap on the market, and you can sort of craft around it from there. For the rings, um, we have a Shaper Ring and a Crusader Ring. The Shaper Ring has life gain for each enemy hit by spells. Um, because Bladefall is casting down so many blades, and there's so much overlap with Blade Blast, you actually get back a considerable amount of life, even just for having 13 life gain for each enemy hit by your spells. Um, then we have a Vermilion Ring that I slammed with a Crusader Orb to get the spell damage, but otherwise it's pretty normal. It's just Dex, which we need in this build, some life, some resistances, and then plus one to minimum endurance charges. The gloves are sort of nice quality of life. You definitely don't need gloves like these, um, but the level 20 blind gives us another defensive layer for any enemies that might be outside of our Flesh and Stone aura. Uh, make sure that they're blind. And then on top of that, if you use an Essence of Insanity like I did here, you get 16% more cast speed for your blade fall, which really just makes the build feel a lot smoother and allows you to transition from using blade fall to moving pretty quickly. Um, belt's pretty standard. The cooldown recovery speed doesn't do anything for this build. I just happened to craft this belt early in the league and really haven't found anything better yet to replace it. But a good Stygian Vice with life, res, um, and perhaps uh, hinder on spell hit for the jewel that you would socket into it would be a good addition to this build. And then finally, the boots. Um, Tailwind boots are extremely easy to craft and harvest. Uh, we crit a lot, so Tailwind is essentially up 100% of the time. Um, and then we have the unveiled craft 20% increased movement speed with 12% chance to gain onslaught for 4 seconds on kill. So that's pretty much it for the itemization. So you see that nothing here is really expensive. The void batteries are, depending on the league, they can be pretty cheap. Um, a lot of the um, mods that we're using on the influenced items are not build changing with the exception of the helmet. And everything else is pretty much just life and res. So if we go over to the tree, um, I think this is where the defensive layers and the DPS in the build really becomes evident. So the first thing is that we're using Milton Faith, which is conquered by High Templar Dominus, which turns the Pain Attunement Keystone into Inner Conviction. The reason the Inner Conviction is so good in this build is we have 10 power charges, which means we get 30% more spell damage per power charge. One of the things that you could use in this build would be the Badge of the Brotherhood Amulet, which sets your max frenzy charges to your maximum power charges. And obviously you can't use this keystone with that. So yes, if you had 10 frenzy charges and you did not have inner conviction, you would have 4% um, more damage per frenzy charge. So you'd have 40% more damage. But I think what's really important to recognize is with inner conviction is that it says gain power charges instead of frenzy charges. It doesn't mean you can't have frenzy charges. So if you want to get close to the damage of Badge of the Brotherhood without actually purchasing it, just get this Keystone Inner Conviction and then craft Frenzy Charges onto your amulets. They still work just fine. So in that way, you get the 30% more damage from your 10 power charges, 
plus you get 12% more damage from your three frenzy charges, which actually ends up being more damage than Badge of the Brotherhood. So I think that's definitely an option to consider because currently in Harvest, Badge of the Brotherhood is a 50 exalt item. And I don't think it's worth 50 exalts when you can get more damage out of um, a few crafts on your jewelry and then socketing a much cheaper timeless jewel with a with a keystone that works really well for our power charge build. So that's where a tremendous amount of the damage comes from this build is, is through inner conviction. Then the second thing we have in terms of our defensive layers in this build is we are a block build. We have a Rumi's flask. And in addition, we have a thread of hope jewel that allows us to pick up glancing blows as well as um, some reduced mana cost of our skills and additional life. Um, you definitely don't need any cluster jewels in this build. I did pick up a three passive Fettle cluster jewel, um, but if you don't have the currency for it or you haven't rolled one yet, you can just path down and pick up Barbarism for the same amount of points. It does net you a little bit less life, but you also get plus one to maximum fire resistance, so you do get some extra mitigation. So it's really not too bad of a trade-off, and so I really don't think this cluster jewel is in any way necessary for this build. Up here we have an intuitive leap jewel. Uh, we Once we got a lot of currency, we did get a corrupted blood cannot be inflicted on you, um, but otherwise these are like a 25c jewel and it allows us to pick up some extra block and some spell damage we also um, get two percent increased spell damage per 100 maximum mana which is actually quite a bit considering we have 1700 mana um, a little bit extra block and some mana regeneration rate and then we pick up our last power charge and because we have 10 power charges in this build this is actually a great little minor node um, because we're going to get 40 percent increased spell damage um, from just that small passive, so we pick that up as well. Um, here we just have a little bit of life and critical strike multiplier. Um, with my gear, I didn't struggle with resistances, but as you can see, this could be a good spot to pick up a little extra resistance if you need it. Um, we pick up the Disciple of the Forbidden Half Wheel, which gives us um, a lot of quality of life. We get multi per power charge, we get critical strike chance per power charge, and we get mana regen per power charge. So this ends up being 80% increased mana regeneration rate. And as you see on the boots, we have 70% increased mana regeneration rate if you've cast a spell recently. So between that and Mystic Bulwark and this small passive here we have a lot of mana regeneration so this build really doesn't struggle with mana when you're mapping and we kill bosses so fast that by the time we run out of mana the boss is already dead anyway um, so it doesn't even much matter otherwise there's really nothing going on with the tree it's a pretty typical um, assassin ascendancy setup here um, we do have a watcher's eye with 12 percent chance to deal double damage while using pride um, these were actually pretty cheap this league. I think I got this one for one and a half exalts. Um, they're really not that expensive at all. And I got very lucky and found one with two grace modifiers, which is great because when we trigger Val Grace, it counts as being affected by grace. So we actually get a little extra dodge chance um, there by having that mod. Um, so that's a nice little trick you can do that if you're using a Val Aura, like maybe Val Haste, see if you can get the 12% chance to deal double damage while using pride alongside something um, where you'll get a benefit when using a Val skill, even though you might not be using that aura in your build normally. So that's pretty much it for the tree. That's pretty much it for the gear. In terms of the flasks, we have you know a classic alchemist quicksilver flask of adrenaline. We have an ample diamond flask of warding. We have a bottled faith flask, which also you don't really need because we do get um, the uh, additional um, base crit chance from our ascendancy so the flask does help a little bit for bosses because you can put the consecrated ground on them and they'll take increased damage um, but i definitely think that there's um, other options for you to put in this place um, we have a roomies which because of glancing blows uh, really takes our block to the next level normally we sit at 3820 when you hit the flask you're at 7240. Um, which actually makes it a really great defensive layer. And one other thing worth mentioning, um, aside from the seething divine, last, divine life flask of staunching, is that we don't have a heat flask. And honestly, you don't need a heat flask in this build, and there's a pretty great reason why. So 
these two new passes were added in the most recent uh, patch, and they came with a couple notables that, in my opinion, if you're anywhere near this spot on the tree, you should be taking these. Uh, one is Anointed Flesh, and the second is an updated Crystal Skin. So starting with Anointed Flesh, as you pass through it, you'll notice that you get 5% reduced effect of non-damaging ailments on you and ailment duration reduction, 30% reduced effect of chill, and 30% reduced freeze duration, and then same thing, 15% reduced duration, 15% reduced effect. And then on our amulet, we anoint crystal skin, which is a little bit similar. We get plus one to all res, 15% chance to avoid elemental ailments. So between these two, we're getting 2% to all maximum elemental resistances, which is great mitigation for our build. But the thing that's really great is that this avoidance and especially the duration reduction on freeze means that although we're not immune to freeze, it's basically unimpactful to this build. So the classic example is you go to open a strong box that has freezes you and activated, you don't have a freeze flask and you die. Well with this build, because the freeze duration is so short, before the monsters can even really attack you, the freeze ends and you're free to fight back against the mobs. So we don't need a heat flask for that reason. And it's really a great addition to pick these up because not only do you get that mitigation from the extra maximum Ellie res, but you gain sort of this quasi immunity to freeze where even if you get frozen, it really doesn't affect you. And even when you're doing maps with chilled ground, you'll notice that it really doesn't even slow you down. So I think anointed flesh and crystal skin are really great pickups on this build. I think they're really great pickups on any build. Um, and of course, if you happen to get shocked or something, you're also getting some reduction from that and you also have a chance to avoid it. So overall, I think picking up those passives gives this build a lot of extra quality of life and a lot of extra damage mitigation. As I said earlier, um, you could craft frenzy charges for more damage. I chose instead to craft uh, minimum endurance charges to get a little bit more um, physical damage reduction. I think another great option for this build, um, you know, if you haven't had an opportunity to craft an amulet and you're sort of, you have enough resistances and you're kind of looking at something you could just buy to put in the amulet slot, I think a really great item that you can get um, is an impressence. Um, the reason for this is that not only do you get vulnerability for free, you don't have to worry about casting it, it doesn't reserve any mana, but every time you kill a rare or unique enemy, you get Maddening Presence for 10 seconds, which reduces the damage that monsters deal and their action speed. So I think if you do pick that up, I think then you can probably afford to craft the Frenzy Charges on the rest of your jewelry. And if you don't pick it up, I think it's a good idea to get that little extra mitigation by going the Endurance Charge route instead. So that's pretty much the whole build. Um, I think it's a great build. It can be a really cheap build. Um, really the most expensive thing you need to get going are the Void Battery Wands and the plus one to maximum power charge helmet. Everything else in this build is stuff that you can acquire over time. It will add damage to the build, but it will mostly play the same regardless. So if you guys are thinking about doing this build, um, you know, I think it's a really great build. I think you'll have a lot of fun with it. And most importantly, it can do all content. It's a fast mapper. As you saw, it can do all the Guardians. It can do Cyrus 8. Maybe Deathless, maybe not. Depends on how bugged or not bugged the fight happens to be on your particular run. Um, but it does chew right through Cyrus because you have all that overlap. And it's a good build for that fight too because you have a lot of regen and you don't necessarily depend on your flasks. So if you guys have any questions about the build, about gear, itemization, the passive tree, or the playstyle, um, just leave a comment below and I'll probably see it and I'll leave a little bit of feedback for you, um, you know, to help you get along with your build. Thanks.